Hello, and welcome to the Carlson Orthodontics Podcast for January 2011. I'm Dr. Sean Carlson, and currently in private practice in Mill Valley, California, and I'm also an associate professor at the University of Pacific School of Dental Medicine. And today I want to share briefly with you um, the fundamentals of x-ray dosimetry. And I'm going to share with you an excerpt from a lecture that was given to the Northeast Society of Orthodontists uh, in November 2010. Dosimetry is what we talk about when we're discussing the absorbed dose of x-rays from exposure to ionizing radiation. And this is something that as a patient in medicine or dentistry, uh, we use x-rays as diagnostic tools. And of course, we want to limit the harmful effects of radiation. And today I want to discuss a little bit about current uh, dosimetry in dentistry and also discuss a little bit about uh, what ionizing ionizing radiation actually means and uh, how we're affected by it in just day-to-day living. So to understand dosimetry and to, to get a grip on the science behind it, I think it's important that everybody is familiar with the International Commission on Radiological Protection. And this is an international group, obviously, and their job is to protect the public. And what the ICRP does is they uh, get together with um, multiple specialists and, and people with high knowledge in radiation exposure and come up with guidelines that are um, meant to serve the medical and dental uh, fields and just to inform the public on what uh, radiological and x-ray exposure should be limited to and uh, their job is really a protection group. And so we're going to keep them in mind when we start talking about x-rays because it's important that we have a a group like this to really serve uh, the public, which really doesn't have financial interest in anything that we do in radiology. So there are a few publications that I think are important um, for both clinicians and for um, patients alike. And the first is uh, this 2007 recommendations paper that was uh, published by the ICRP. Again, this is sort of the protection body um, regarding x-rays, and I think this is a good uh, publication that people should read uh, to familiarize themselves with what the ICRP is really recommending as of 2007. Two additional papers that I think represent the uh, the best in dosimetry currently um, for dental radiology, and both of these were published by Ludlow and colleagues, um, who's a group from North Carolina, and I think these are the most comprehensive uh, publications on x-rays that we have currently. Now, there's a lot in the literature, and I think it's going to be important to um, keep in mind this date of 2007 and what we're going to find um, as we go through a little bit more of this podcast. You're going to see 2007 is an important date, and anything before that is really now obsolete. So getting back to the ICRP a little bit, I think if you if you dig into the information that they they give out, there are really two things that I think are big take-home messages. And the first is that their recommendation for non-occupational exposure is 1,000 microsieverts per year. That means if you don't work in medicine or radiology and you're a patient, the maximum exposure to ionizing radiation should be no more than a thousand microsieverts. And uh, when we discuss dosimetry, we speak in terms of microsieverts, which is basically a a quantification of um, effective dose of x-rays. And it's really one way that we measure how x-rays affect the body. The second thing that's important to take from the ICRP is that uh, clinicians, research scientists, and the the public alike should be using the 2007 effective dose tissue weightings. Now this changed in 2007 dramatically from the previous uh, weights that were used in 1990. 
it's important to emphasize the 2007 tissue weightings uh, because if we go back in the literature to the previous tissue weightings that were released by the ICRP in 1990, they had considerably less risk associated with x-rays. And the most recent uh, publication by the ICRP using the 2007 weightings, it's really affecting how we actually look at medical and dental radiology in terms of um, effective dose or exposure. This table is an excerpt from uh, one of the Ludlow publications and um, it covers a lot of typical dental x-rays quite well. And what's interesting to note is if you look at the effective dose column, again all reported in microsieverts, you can see the 1990 tissue weights compared with the 2007 tissue weights. And what you'll notice is they've dramatically increased for a number of these x-rays. So again, I think anything moving forward in dentistry or medicine should now use the 2007 tissue weights. So when we discuss dosimetry or the effective dose of x-rays, it's important that we're using these weightings, and I think uh, the numbers here from Ludlow uh, really cover the majority of, of what we see in dental uh, radiology. This is uh, from the second paper by Ludlow, and, and this gets now into the cone beam CT, which is sort of the most common um, or I guess the most uh, modern orthodontic x-ray technique. And uh, this covers a number of cone beam CT machines and discusses their effective dose. And here, here you can see in the first uh, two columns of effective dose, one is using the 1990 tissue weights, the second is using the 2007 tissue weights. And again, I think for anything uh, that we're speaking about or publishing in, from here forward, really needs to use these uh, 2007 tissue weights. Um, here I've actually highlighted the next generation iCAT, um, which is actually the machine that I have in my office. And again, you can see here where that falls in terms of effective dose in microsieverts using the 2007 tissue weights. Now to kind of dissect what's, what's in the two papers um, from Ludlow, these are the most common dental x-rays that we use. And all these numbers here, uh, again, emphasizing the 2007 tissue weighting, you can see the effective dose in terms of microsieverts. And the first is um, for a set of digital bite wings or a, a digital lateral cephalometric x-ray, um, the effective dose or the exposure is, is around 5.6 microsieverts. Um, digital panoramic x-ray, uh, this is about 24.3 microsieverts. The digital full mouth x-ray or full series of dental x-rays, again this is using F-speed film, the fastest film that we have in dentistry, and rectangular collumation, and uh, we'll discuss that a little bit later. Uh, the exposure there is just under 35 microsieverts, and again, the uh, the cone beam CT, which again is the most current uh, method for imaging orthodontic patients, uh, around 74 microsieverts. Now, putting this in perspective of the ICRP's recommendation, r recall that they're they're recommending that we limit our exposure to a thousand microsieverts per year again and that's their their goal of staying sort of in the safe zone in terms of risk for exposure and here you can just see the percentages of these and even um, the highest microsievert dose which is the um, the full volume cone beam CT we're still in these under 10 percent range the most exposure here is 7.4 percent now we talked a little bit about, uh, or I mentioned the rectangular collumation um, for uh, regular dental x-rays, and it's very important that rectangular collimation is used, and um, if it's not, what you can see is things change dramatically when a full mouth series is taken um, using uh, round cones or uh, non-rectangular collumated cones, you can see that we've increased the dose by almost six-fold here. And um, 
depending on um, how uh, most dentists are following the recommendations by the ICRP and uh, most uh, radiological commissions now, uh, just about all dentists have, have moved over to rectangular collimation. And I think uh, it's important to, to be sure that we are actually doing that in dentistry to keep the exposure down. To put this in perspective of uh, just living a regular normal life, our worldwide uh, background radiation dose is typically about 2.4 millisieverts per year, and this converts to about 6.6 .6 microsieverts per day. Now, in uh, populated countries in the United States, for example, uh, the ICRP um, suggests that this is probably closer to around 8.2 microsieverts per day. And so by just getting up and doing your normal daily routine, you're already exposed to um, about 8.2 microsieverts. So how does that correlate with, with what we do in dentistry? Here I've just calculated the microsievert exposure um, based on relative background exposure. And that means here that the digital lateral ceph or the bite wings is typically just under a day in terms of um, its relation to background dose. Uh, for a panoramic x-ray, it's about three days um, equivalent uh, background exposure. Um, a CPCT, which is the kind we're taking in our office now, uh, about nine uh, background days of exposure and um, a full mouth x-ray which you would get at the dentist with um, you know taking x-rays of all of the teeth again if rectangular collimation isn't used you're looking at 21 days of, of background exposure which is uh, about two uh, two plus times um, what we're doing with our uh, low volume um, cone beam CT again if uh, your dentist or most dentists, as I would expect, are using rectangular collumation. You can get that background exposure um, relationship down to about four and a half background days, um, which is just about one half what we're um, doing with the cone beam CT. Now, the real question is how much more information are we gathering from um, this mild increase in exposure. And you can see here, uh, uh, most common orthodontic x-rays are the two on the left side, which are a panoramic x-ray and a cephalometric x-ray. Combined, the relative exposure is around 30 microsieverts, or 3% of the annual uh, recommended dose uh, from the ICRP. The uh, low-resolution uh, uh, ICAT, which is what we're taking in our office, is uh, just about twice that. But as you can see from this movie, the information that we're gathering is um, far more uh, detailed, far more diagnostic. And for me, having used this three-dimensional uh, imaging in my office now for over two years, um, the advantages it's bringing to uh, the way that I treat and the accuracy with which I can actually diagnose orthodontics is uh, much greater than uh, the most common orthodontic series that you're seeing on the left side. Now, I want to put this exposure a little bit in perspective because our goal is of course we want to minimize the risk and if the 3D image um, is increasing the risk and again you see it's about twice what we're doing in um, the more common orthodontic x-rays for 10 times the information uh, this risk we still want to minimize it and to put it in perspective of, of what we do in normal life um, there have been a number of papers that uh, look at just air travel and it's something that we don't really associate with um, ionizing radiation exposure but uh, just getting in an airplane exposes us to about three to nine microsieverts per hour depending on how high we fly and which part of the world you're flying in so depending on where you're going and how often you fly, um, just thinking about a typical trip from San Francisco to, to New York, um, a round trip airplane flight um, is depending on, um, you know, whether you have layovers or not, this is actually just a, a direct flight, which is a little bit less flight time. Um, just with a round trip from uh, San Francisco to New York, you're exposed to about 72 microsieverts. So this is just about one uh, of the x-rays that we're currently taking in our office, 
or one cone beam CT. Now to think about um, how much we evaluate this this radiation risk when we're getting on a plane, it's probably minimal. And I think the diagnostic information that we get from a single orthodontic cone beam x-ray um, far outweighs um, the uh, what we're gaining in terms of diagnostic information from a, a transcontinental uh, flight. So although this exposure is out there and, and we get it doing very common things like flying, when you put it in perspective of the information we're gathering from these um, orthodontic 3D x-rays, I think it really starts to make sense that we're keeping the um, exposure risk incredibly low even though we're moving into this uh, cone beam CT 3D world. Now, if you fly a little further and you're looking at going from San Francisco to Paris, you've just uh, more than doubled your exposure because these flights fly a little bit higher and uh, they're in the air a little bit longer. So now just going to Europe and back, um, you're looking at a relative risk of about two cone beam um, orthodontic 3D x-rays. So when you put it in perspective of flying, it does make a little bit more sense how minimal the exposure risk is with most of the imaging that we're doing in dentistry. And I think what's the best thing to emphasize is, is really the amount of diagnostic information we're getting from this single x-ray, not to mention the, uh, the ease at which this x-ray is required. And again, when compared to a, a simple airplane flight, um, this is comparable to just flying to New York and back. And uh, the more comprehensive orthodontic series, which is actually what we um, used to take in our office, is depicted here on the left side. And this is a, a more comprehensive set of x-rays, which includes periapical x-rays, panoramic x-ray, and a cephalometric x-ray. You can see as far as relative risk of exposure, um, we're about equal to our single cone beam x-ray. Again, both of these are comparable to a single transcontinental flight or coast-to-coast -coast flight. Now if rectangular collumation isn't used and for some reason there's a, a, a round um, x-ray tube, round collumation is used, um, you can see how much that uh, the exposure jumps um, from 65 to over 200 microsieverts. And again, we want to keep this much, much lower and I think even if we're working in the 3D world, uh, which is where I live now, uh, we're well below um, a non-collumated uh, set of x-rays. So again, this is a brief overview of, of what we're doing in, in uh, dental x-rays and how dosimetry um, affects us. Uh, you can find out more in future podcasts, and please subscribe in iTunes, and I'll be back with more information. <laughs>